Have you ever wondered what i.resolution, i.dynamic, and i.iso mean on your Lumix camera? Well, how about we find out? Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here at youtube.com slash photo joseph every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. If you can't watch live, you can watch it some other time, but if you can watch live, then it's super cool and fun because you get to participate in the chat, in the comments like this. Look, this is a live chat. This is a live show. So for those of you watching not live and you're like, why? It's live. It's all live. We are streaming right now to Twitter, uh, to Twitter. We're not streaming to Twitter. We're streaming to YouTube, we're streaming to Facebook, and we're streaming to Twitch. I see there's at least one person watching in Twitch. If uh, Twitch, I will see your questions here. If you're on Facebook, um, try and ju try and jump over to um, to the to the YouTube stream because it's easier for me to follow the questions there. Anyway, let's get this thing going. So we want to find out what these I dot modes are on your Lumix cameras. And there are probably similar modes in other cameras. This information probably applies to many other manufacturers, but I know the Lumix ones, so this is where we're going to focus on it. And the biggest the biggest question I think right off is, um, other than the obvious, what 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 is it, is um, should I use it and is it, is it going to make any difference? So we're going to try and answer all of that. We're going to start with the one that has the biggest difference regardless of whether you're shooting RAW or JPEG or frankly what you're shooting, and that is I.ISO. So let's explain, first of all, how you get into this. When you're looking at your camera and you're adjusting the ISO, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up my G9 here. I've got a G9 and the GX85 here. I can't actually plug this one into the switcher, but we'll take a look at it on the G9. And if I, let's see here, let's pull this up, make sure it's up, yes it is. Pull this up here, look in the bottom of the screen. I have my ISO options. So you have ISO auto, and then you have this I ISO, and then you have your low, and then you know your, your 200, 400, and so on, so on, so on, ISOs. So you may not always see I.ISO. For example, the camera right now is an aperture priority. If I switch this over to manual mode and I go back into the ISO, it is no longer there. I.ISO is not there. If I go back into aperture priority or any of these semi-automatic modes, then I.ISO will be there. Okay, so it's there. That's how we turn it on, just like a regular ISO. What does it actually mean, though? So here's the thing. It's an intelligent ISO. It will adjust the ISO dependent on the scene, dependent on what it sees. Specifically, it's looking for motion. If it sees motion, then it is going to opt for a higher ISO so that it can give you a faster shutter speed. You think about it like this. If you're taking a picture of a landscape, nothing's moving, it's a static scene. In general, you want the lowest ISO possible because you want to have the cleanest picture possible, like the lower ISO, less noise. If, however, well, which means, sorry, um, lower ISO, that means that you will have a longer shutter speed. So on a photograph like a landscape where things are not moving, then you can, uh, you can afford that, right? You can afford to have a longer shutter speed, say a 30th of a second, 60th of a second, whatever it might be, and you don't have to worry about the motion, you know, any kind of motion blur. However, if you start photographing things that are moving, people, cars, bouncing children, whatever, you probably want to freeze that motion. At least that's what the camera is going to assume that you want to do. And therefore, you need a faster shutter speed, which means, therefore, you need a faster ISO. So I ran a little test this morning just to see how well this actually worked. And it works really well. This is kind of fun. So I'm going to pull up some pictures that I shot in, uh, that I photographed this morning, and we're going to bring them up into Lightroom. Let's go to raw photos, because that's where these are. And we're just going to look at this last one here. So this is me, obviously, sitting very still, right? And if we look at the settings of the camera, you'll see over here that it shows a 60th of a second at 5.6. I think it was aperture priority. I think so. Um, at ISO 2000. Okay, so that, that is a proper exposure for that setup. Me sitting in the chair here, lights as they are, that's proper exposure. Nobody's moving. And then I went and pushed the button again. Instead of just sitting there, I started jumping up and down like a wild monkey in front of the camera. Right. And for that picture, let's go to the next one. There's me midair. It's brilliant, obviously. Look at the ISO. The ISO jumped up to 4,000, and it shot it at 125th of a second, still at f5.6. So the previous photo, 60th, ISO 2,000. Me jumping up and down like an idiot, 1, 125th, ISO 4,000. So the camera automatically saw the motion and went, oh, it sounds like a good idea to crank up the ISO. So that is what intelligent ISO does, I ISO or intelligent ISO. If you actually look in the manual and you try and do a search for I.ISO, you might not find it because it's listed in there as intelligent ISO, where the other modes we're going to talk about are listed as I dot resolution and so on. Um, but uh, if you want to find it, read more about it. It'll tell you basically what I just told you. But that is the idea. It will automatically adjust the ISO depending on the content of the scene. Pretty cool. So my recommendation, if you're using automatic ISO, 
put it in the intelligent ISO. Don't you see straight auto? Put it in intelligent auto. That way it will actually read the scene and adjust accordingly. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so that's the first one. The next two are i.resolution and i.dynamic. We're going to start with dynamic because that one is easy to see, and I was able to create some samples of this this morning. i.resolution is a little bit harder to see. I actually couldn't get it to make a visual difference that I could see, but I did find some older references online to it. Uh, so we're going to take a look at those. Incidentally, if you are watching live, make sure that you do participate in the chat room. We will be doing a Q&A after the show. We'll bring that up. Um, again, we have got our live chat happening over here. I see people flying by. We will bring that up at the end and do a Q&A portion of the show. So uh, make sure you get your questions ready for that. Also, I just wanted to throw this up real quick, too, to remind you of our value for value model here on the show. If you feel like you have learned something from today's show, that is kind of the whole idea after all, if you learned something from today's show, and if you took value from today's show, then consider putting value back. Head over to photojoseph.com support, and you'll find all kinds of lovely ways that you can provide value. Incidentally, one of those ways is the GH5 training if you're a GH5 user. Or if you really want to have some fun, you could join me in India. I am going to India, and I'm taking up to eight photographers with me. Heck, you don't have to be a full-time photographer. You can just be any person who enjoys taking pictures and wants to go to India. This is going to be early next year, January 30th. 30th through February 9th of 2019, um, but sign up now. It's at photojoseph.com slash India. You're going to find all the good information that you need in there, and I would encourage you to please consider coming along. If you have any questions about it, you know how to find out. Hit me up anywhere, and I will do my best to answer them for you. But that's going to be a lot of fun, and I would love to have some of you coming there with me. Okay. I.resolution and I.dynamic. So dynamic is the first one. Dynamic, as in dynamic range. If you're not familiar with that concept, the idea behind dynamic range is the, the range range of your darkest shadows, your darkest darks, to your brightest brights, your brightest highlights that can be seen at any given time. If you have a very narrow dynamic range, then you don't have very dark shadows to very bright highlights. And that could be based off of the capability of your camera. It could also just be the scene itself. For example, if you are like in here looking at this scene, even though there's a black background and a white background, the dynamic range is not massive in here. That black is not pure black. The white is not pure white. So the dynamic range is fairly compressed. If we go outside in the full sun, but we also have something that's in a dark shadow from a building or whatever right next to it, that's a huge dynamic range. Your darkest shadow is really, really dark. Your brightest highlight is really, really bright. So you have this extended, very large dynamic range. The whole idea behind HDR, high dynamic range photography, is generally that you are taking pictures that are beyond the capability of your camera, blending them together to try and get more dynamic range into a single scene. That's kind of what HDR photography is. The i.dynamic feature in the cameras, what is it is going to do is going to try and get more range into the scene at once. It's basically going to lift the shadows up so that your darkest shadows become visible, pull your highlights down, your brightest highlights, pull them in so they become visible, so that when you're looking at the photo, you go, oh, well, I can see the details in that bright cloud, and I can see the details in that dark shadow all at once. And the camera does this automatically. Now, here's the kicker. It only is going to apply to your JPEGs. This is the kind of thing that gets rendered into the JPEG. It is not into the raw file. So let's take a look at some samples of what this looks like, because that is something I was able to create this morning. And uh, let's uh, pull this up. Let's see here. I think I need to go back to the JPEG view here. I'll, I'll find the right thing here. Oh, that's right. I always forget how this thing works in Lightroom sometimes. I use this thing all the time, and still I'm like, where sometimes? Oh. OK, so we're going to take a look at the JPEGs here. And here is the scene. So this is with iDynamic turned off. And let's take a quick look in the menu settings on the camera itself. Let's, um, let's switch over here real quick and go into the menus. And you'll see under the camera options, you have i.resolution and i.dynamic. And we're looking at i.dynamic. You can go for off. You can go to low, standard, high, or auto. Probably you don't generally leave it to auto unless you have a very specific scene that you're doing. but. Um, but let's just take a look at what we're actually getting out of it. So let's go back to the Mac. And here's the first picture. So this is with it off. And you can see my, my clouds are a bit blown out. This is the JPEG. Clouds are a bit blown out. Quite dark shadows here. And then I go through and I turn it on low, medium, and high. And then there's auto. And auto, in this case, grabbed the high. So let's just compare high, because that's our best representation, to off in here. And you can see massively in the shadows. Look at how much is lifted up the shadows in here. All right, looking pretty good. And the highlights, it has definitely pulled it back. It hasn't pulled it back quite far enough to get full detail in the clouds. There are, after all, some pretty bright clouds up there. But it is a massive, massive difference. I mean, that is completely blown out clouds to mostly visible clouds in there. 
Now, I said that this doesn't apply to the raw, but as those words are coming out of my mouth, it occurred to me that I didn't actually verify that. So we're going to verify that. Now let's look at the raw. We'll go to here. There's off, low, medium, high. And well, isn't that interesting? It's like a very, very subtle difference. But there does appear to be a slight difference in there. Huh. Very curious. Very curious indeed. Well, there you go. I think that re requires more testing. It might actually have a very subtle difference in the raw as well. That's hard to tell. That could just be the scene changing as the clouds are going by. Certainly not as dynamic as the um, as the JPEGs were, but that is uh, that's actually a little bit surprising. So maybe it does make a very slight difference to the raws, but it is primarily for the JPEG. So if you, you're thinking, well, I never shoot JPEG, what's the point? I always, always recommend, especially if you're playing with the, the um, color modes, the color profiles in your camera, that you shoot raw plus JPEG. So you get both. That way you have that JPEG that's what the camera wanted to create, what the camera created itself. That's what matches what you see on the back of the LCD. And then you also have the raw. We've talked about that a whole bunch, and it's just something I always do. Always shoot raw plus JPEG. And in that situation, that's obviously what I did here. You get both. You get that result from the camera, plus you get the raw file to go back to. Okay, so the third one is I dot resolution. Now, this is probably the most confusing one because you're thinking, well, hold on, is it going to change the actual resolution of my file? I'm shooting, you know, 20 megapixels or whatever it might be. I don't, what am I suddenly going to get a 30 megapixel file or only a 10 megapixel file? No. What it really is, it's essentially sharpening. It's a little bit more advanced than sharpening. And just because we can, we're going to look at what this says in the manual because <laughs> you're going to like this. It's a really, really um, let's go back to here. In the manual, this is for the manual for the GH5, but um, you know it's going to be the same everywhere. I dot resolution. Pictures with sharp profile and resolution can be taken using the intelligent resolution technology. Thank you. We now have intelligent resolution technology. Okay. It is essentially sharpening and maybe a little bit of contrast, edge detection contrast sort type of thing going on. It is going to enhance the apparent resolution of the file, of the photo. That's where the resolution comes from. We've talked about before when doing sharpening, when you're adjusting the sharpening of the image, it is an apparent sharpness, right? It's not like the image is becoming more in focus. The way sharpening works is it looks for edges. Let's just say the edge, like from my shirt to the gray background or the white background there. It finds those edges and it increases the contrast on either side of the edge. So if you think about zooming way, way into my, the edge of my arm, let's do this side against the white, way, way into the edge of my arm here, you have, actually, no, let's do it against the gray. That's probably an easier idea. Uh, if you were to zoom way, way into here, and you've got essentially a row of pixels that is the edge of my shirt, and then another row of pixels that is the edge of the background. So the first layer of background versus the last layer of shirt. Does that make sense? And you increase the contrast just around the edge the perception will be that it's sharper because you have a higher contrast, larger separation between the background and the foreground. It could be hair. If you have a hair, a strand of hair um, against a, a dark hair against a light background, by increasing the contrast around the edges of that hair, it becomes apparently sharper. Now, we talk about resolution and effective resolution a lot. And the idea behind effective resolution is if you were to sharpen an image um, if you were to, how do I explain this better? If you, let's take a look at, let's talk about this from the sense of the uh, removal of the anti-aliasing filter that has happened across the Lumix line, well, maybe not across the entire line, but from most of the line now, where you had a camera that, the GX8 was the first one that removed the anti-aliasing filter, and you had a sensor that was a 16, I think it's right, 16 megapixel sensor, I believe that's right. And the 16 megapixel sensors always had the um, anti-aliasing filter on there. The anti-aliasing filter has the benefit of removing a moiré pattern, but it has the drawback of detracting a little bit of sharpness, takes a little bit of sharpness away. When that filter was removed, Amazon, uh, when that filter was removed, Panasonic said that the effective resolution of the camera was more like 20 megapixels, meaning if you were to take a 20 megapixel photo with the anti-aliasing filter on, and then you took a 16 megapixel photo with the anti-aliasing filter off, they would appear to the eye to be the same resolution. If you were to zoom one in a little bit more than the other so that they were the same size, uh, you know, same size on screen, that the, the uh, one without the filter, so it's a sharper image, would appear to be at higher resolution, so an effective resolution. That's effectively what's happening here. It's simply by adding a little bit of sharpening, it has increased the effective resolution, apparent resolution. It's not really affecting the resolution. It just kind of looks that way to the eye. 
kind of kind of sort of makes sense. It really is just sharpening. It really is just sharpening. So now the the menu has. Let's go back into the camera here. You have the options in here of low standard and high. And on the Lumix GX85 and some other cameras, there's an extended as well, so it's even higher. It doesn't have an auto, though, and I don't know why the extended isn't in all the cameras. Um, maybe it was deemed to be too much, but there's low standard high and possibly extended. The funny thing is, and I can't plug this in to show you, but the extended is out of order on the menu. It's like high, standard, low, and then extended. It's a little bit odd, so you would think maybe it's less than low, but it's, it's the highest one. I, I looked that up to verify it, um, but it gives you that extra sharpening that, again, is applied to the JPEG. Now, I went out and I shot several photos with both of these cameras trying to see the difference. I just, I couldn't see the difference. But I did find a very old article that actually dates back to the Lumix GH3 that has samples that show it pretty well. So let's take a look at that now, and then we're going to wrap this thing up and head over to the Q&A. So uh, let's see here, go back to the computer. So this is the sample photo. This website is dcresource.com. I will put a link to this down below for anyone who's curious about uh, reading the full thing. But here is with intelligent um, resolution off, eye resolution off. And then as I go through, there's low, standard, high, and then extended. You'll see how the image appears to get just a little bit sharper. The contrast is changing, especially around the edges. Let me go between off, because that's going to be the easiest to see, up to extended. And I'll toggle back and forth between those a few times. And if you look at the detail of the building here, the highlights versus the shadows, the bright spots versus the dark spots, you'll see that slight increase in sharpness. And that is, again, sharpening in software. It's not sharpening from the, uh, the camera being refocused. So it's an apparent sharpness. It's an apparent resolution shift, just a little bit higher resolution. And that's it. So what, what is my recommendation? Well, going back to intelligent ISO, I say use intelligent ISO. I think it's brilliant. Leave that on. If you're only ever shooting raw, then the eye resolution and eye dynamic probably don't make any difference. We saw it might have made a subtle difference with the dynamic, but I, I would just, just leave them off because that's the kind of thing that you're going to do in post anyway. But if you're shooting JPEG or shooting raw plus JPEG, then put them on. Put the dynamic one at, um, at auto. I would leave that one at auto. And for the resolution one, I would say standard. And if you feel like your JPEGs are coming out a little bit over sharpened, a little bit too much, then back it off to low. And you know maybe you end up turning it off altogether. But give it a try. Give it a try and see if it's something that you like, um, if you like the results coming out of it. And if, uh, and again, if you're wondering why on earth you would ever want to shoot JPEG, remember that one of the things you can do with these cameras is transmit your file wirelessly from the camera to your smartphone for instant sharing to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you like. And that will allow you to have that image, the JPEG that was created in camera, whatever look you dialed into the camera, baked into that JPEG file that you can then share it immediately. And obviously, at any point, you can pull those files into your computer, get the raw file, and start all over again if that's what you want. Or if you don't, if you just look at the JPEG and go, actually, I'm, thumbs up to that. I'm good with that. Why mess around with the raw in the first place? If you're happy with the JPEG, just go for it. Okay. That, my friends, is eye resolution, eye dynamic, and eye ISO. I hope that was useful to you. If you have any questions about what we just talked about, stick around. We'll do the Q&A coming up next.